No, you guys are good. I uh, just making sure everything works good. Um, this is not going to be a, on Twitter or anything. It's just for my mother. So, so um, shout out to her on the live stream. So, hi. Um, well, hello. How's everyone doing today? Can you hear me okay? Okay. I'm a mover, and this thing is moving, so I apologize if I move too much. Uh, this talk is for you. I've seen it before, so please interrupt me if you have any questions, and definitely uh, ask questions at the end, and I'll be around afterwards. I think we have a break after this. So, um, uh, my name is Rob Trohan. I'm, uh, I work out of my garage in San Diego. I'm just a solo person, and I've just come up with map innovation stuff. Um, this bounty box here says San Diego, if you haven't uh, done the math, but that's, I'm in the suburbs of San Diego. And um, I write and blog at roblabs.com. And this talk is at um, that URL that's as big as I can make it, but it's uh, mobilefirst.roblabs.com, and first is just um, uh, not spelled out. So um, we're talking about offline maps for mobile. I've been studying offline maps for about two years. Um, and this is just some of the work and the products that I make out of it. Um, this is not really a product pitch. It's a little bit because I want to show you what's out there out on the App Store. But it's a, a lot of technical stuff too as well. So, so one of the things I, I in studying offline maps, um, you'll notice this talk is also open sourced. But you'll notice my Wi-Fi is off. There's a lot of good reasons to think about Wi-Fi being off, especially when you're thinking about making mobile maps. OK, so in this talk, just a quick introduction. There's, um, it's built up. It's all web page, so everything's built up in, in um, sections so you can navigate if you ever want to go back to something. Like I said, this talk's for you, so it, hopefully it's useful for you. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I talk about offline maps because I care about experiences and I care about people being prepared. A lot of the maps I make are for backcountry areas, wilderness areas, and I'm in San Diego, so there's a couple of national forests near me, there's Joshua Tree, and, um, and uh, I've done maps for the Boundary Waters as well, up in um, the north woods of, um, of uh, Minnesota and in and lower Ontario. And I care about um, uh, people's experience, but I also care about people's safety, and I think a map is an important part of that, and I'll be talking about that as well. OK, so maps tell a story. That's what I tell my family. But also, don't forget about the navigation. When you think about a mobile map for backcountry, this is your competition. You're miss we're missing the compass in this photo, but there should be a compass involved with this. So a, a map in the backcountry should include navigation. So when we have navigation and we make a mobile map, we're really competing with navigation with a paper map. But what can we do to make things better? So you can see in the, in the sample here, this is uh, the Mount Whitney area. And I have a live demo of that running in the simulator. But in case it doesn't work, you have things you would expect out of a mobile map, like search. This is offline search, all the points of interest you'd be interested in. And let me see if I can get this to work in the simulator. So there's Mount Whitney. And the slowness of this is due to the, it's running on the host. So um, hopefully it's not this poor of an experience. And you, you see like um, lakes, and there's um, information about glaciers, and uh, I use data sets from federal sources. I'll be talking about that. But the thing I wanted to show you here was um, if I type for Whitney, there's the Whitney Portal Campground, there's the Portal Trailhead, and there's also the peak itself. So you, you, do, you do the things that you would expect to do if you had an offline map. I, I want to find where the trailhead is, and I want to get to the top. OK, so there's a little blob about um, the theory of maps, like why do you want to be prepared? Um, and I took a, a couple different principles. There's the leave no trace principle about going well prepared, and that's plan ahead and prepare. And a map for backcountry hikers is a 10 essential. The Boy Scouts have a model called be prepared. There's this concept of read, read, read the manual. If you look at uh, Stack Overflow, I just found one last night from 2011, and the answer was read the manual. I, it's unbelievable, but it, it's true, and that's really just be prepared. And then use your brains. So why go out to the back country and be unprepared? But what I really don't want to do is make another social app. I don't want to make an app that people have to have and have to have all the time so they can track and check in and gamify. So it's, it's, it's not 
It's not that. And tracking is a big thing to me. Um, and the quote there is, another app to usurp your time in the wilderness. I take, I take um, an, a phone with me for a map, but I also listen to music. So that's the things I enjoy out in the wilderness for, for myself when I'm in my tent. The other thing about experience is I want to uh, distribute great spatial information. Okay? So... Um, this is why you go out right here. This is a Joshua Tree from last night. The sun was setting and it, it was beautiful. I don't know how cold it is. I don't know if it's windy. I don't know if it's going to rain. I don't know how to be prepared to go out to that point right there, but you should have a way to, to do that kind of research. So um, this is the marketing blather that we have on, on the apps itself in the App Store. Um, the things I like to point out are the shaded relief which are the raster layers, and then the, the topographic uh, in uh, imperial units at 40-foot 40, 40 contour intervals. Seems to be a big deal for Americans. I don't know most Americans that would climb a 3,000-meter uh, peak versus a 14,000. They'd rather go to the 14,000. Okay, so when I think about mobile first, I think about um, what that really means. I throw it around, I bandy it about, I have a web page for it, but it means natively offline, okay? so. I thought about this, it's, I'm really designing for airplane mode. That's why I'm offline for this talk right now because I don't have to, want to rely on a network. So we're designing something for airplane mode. And there's that, that's the key right there is airplane mode. Okay, so when, you have, when you're talking about mobile first, the other, the other kind of pitch things are it's natively offline, like I said. Um, the second bullet there is everything's built and stored as local assets. That's the second key. So nothing, there's no server. I call this truly serverless maps. Uh, I, uh, the only server I have is some server at apple.com that runs the Apple App Store. Um, and if, if I get, ever get around to updating my Google Apps, Google Play Apps, those will be, that's the only other server we have. Now, when you don't track location and it works without a network, um, we, we're trying to go for a really good experience. The other thing it goes for is privacy. So if there's no server, then there can be no tracking, and there's no privacy issues. Okay, so I don't do analytics. I pulled analytics off my, my um, roblabs.com. It was unactionable information, just useless, just passing it to Google, which is fine, but I, I want to get to the point where I'm saying, I have privacy maps, why am I tracking you on the .com? And um, privacy is security. Um, Security is privacy? No, privacy is security. So it increases your security a lot. Um, so th that's another thing that I'm going for here. So private maps. And I have a section here that talks about the data. That was the introduction. So this is going to go through where I get data. O OSM is one section of data. And federal sources is the next, so I'll go through all that. Okay. So everything in this next section for data, it's, it's the tagline from the, the, comp, uh, the organization I got the data from. So this is what, how uh, OpenStreetMap kind of tags himself in a sentence. And uh, the original goal for making these offline maps was, wow, this OSM data is so cool. How do I unlock it? How do I make it useful for um, uh, the MPS guest at, at, at uh, Joshua Tree? Um, when, when I, a lot of this work, I should point out in this last bullet, a lot of this work came from conversations and thoughts on my drive back from Boulder last year. So I've only been working on this section of the, of the, of the technology since last year. And this quote stuck with me. I wanted to throw it in here. Um, if you go to OSM, the, roads the road people are all set. The trail people, not so much. We're, we're, um, uh, it, it's a different world. We don't have people doing updates of trails because they drove their car on a trail. So I, I use OSM data, but I want to talk about the next slide about where I get it. How do I get um, tile offline local assets for OSM? I get it from openmaptiles.org. It's just technology from Cloak and Tech. And um, it's, it's worthwhile checking it out. There's openmaptiles.org. That's the open source part. And then they have a service business, openmaptiles.com. Um, they're, they're huge open source people, they're Phosphor G people, they're say the map Milan people, and, but they also want to have a business, so that's the .com part, so there's a .org and .com. The next set of data comes from um, the USGS. This is their um, uh, marketing sentence, um, and they do fantastic stuff. Their data is so cool. Um, they have something called the national map, 
And if anybody tells you they don't update the national map, they're wrong. This is actually, a, I pulled this data from May, but basically they're updating GOPDFs in seven and a half minute quadrangles on a very regular basis. They have a technology center, I can't remember where it is, but if you go look at their logs, they're doing 30 a day. So they, they do update GOPDFs, and you can use those and download those and print those and have a regular print map for navigation as, as before. And this is a screen capture of how the data comes out. You can get it in shapefile or um, GDBs or whatever you need to. And this is an example of the raw contour data. Um, this is, I won't make a guess where this is, but this is um, Yosemite Valley. So there's the valley in the flat area, and that's El Capitan. And I'm just incredibly impressed with how the people who figured out the elevations of El Capitan, it, it is pretty incredibly steep. And this next uh, little vid video is uh, the other layers that come out of a geo PDF. So the text at the top shows you the ortho image, hydrography, contours, uh, UTM, geographic names. So those are the names, and I'll just kind of let that run a second as I'm talking. So as you um, use the Adobe GeoPDF viewer, I can't remember if that's exactly what it's called, but it's from Adobe, and there's some sort of plugin from TerraGeo maybe. Um, you just kind of click on the view layers, and this is what's available in a 30 megabyte PDF that comes from USGS. So they, they put, publish fantastic data, and um, hey, once again, let's unlock it. That's what I'm going for. The Forest Service. Um, they have a, something called a, an enterprise database, and for the entire Forest Service, they do uh, roads, uh, um, roads for like Jeeps, uh, fire roads, uh, gates. I found gates and the angle of what a, whatever a gate is placed on. I thought that was kind of interesting. And they update on a regular basis. They update probably once a month. And so this is a link to the Forest Service data. Um, this is the National Park Service. They do a fantastic job with icons and I, I, why would I bother making new icons for a tent? There's, there's zero reason to do it, and the National Park uh, Service NPM Symbol Library is a great place to start. And this is a kind of an idea of, okay, these names, I'm not gonna come up with these names, these names come from the USGS. Um, up in the upper right-hand corner, it says Clouds Rest and Quarter Dome, and Half Dome and Moraine Dome. Why would I go bother uh, fighting some other system, like making it up myself or uh, making sure there's the wrong, uh, not the wrong entry in OSM? I'll use OSM for other por portions, but for offline maps for backcountry, uh, I'll, I'll use the authority, the authoritative data. This is another thing. The reason I'm, this is in the NPS section, as this GIF loads, this, you can see there's the contours. I had to give you some place of where, where it was, where you were. In black, when it rolls around, so, uh, let me say green, green is all the trails in Yosemite. Black is the Pacific Crest Trail, and then the dots, the purple dots are the points of interest. The points of interest could be a fall, it could be a trailhead, it could be uh, a name of a valley, it's just the geographic names database. So once again, we want to use the data that's out, out there and unlock it. The NGA um, does really cool stuff. They publish UTM. Why would I go f generate UTM lines when I can go find a shapefile? Once again, I don't want to repeat anything. I just want to make use and unlock what we already have uh, published as a, as, a, as a nation, basically. And wilderness.net, this is a project out of the University of Montana. They publish shapefiles of uh, wilderness areas managed by BLM, U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, and Fish and Wildlife Service. And let's make use of that. So this section here is called Tools, and I'm just gonna, probably gonna buzz by it because it's pretty heavy in detail, and it's worthwhile to know what's out there. Um, this is a lot of the Phosphor G tools um, um, and, and details around it. Um, so I'll go fast, but I'll, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on it. So there's the GeoJSON. Um, data structure and tools around it, like how to view a GeoJSON online. There's the GDAL tools that come from OSGEO. And uh, I mentioned it because we I end up using these tools, so Ogre to Ogre, and how to install it. Uh, Mapbox does a fantastic, it's worth st sticking around here for a second. Mapbox has done a fantastic job with uh, open source tools. I learned by just reading stuff out, um, out in the corpus of work and GitHub. And so here, these are some of the tools I use, including um, Tippy Canoe and um, 
Mapbox Studio. So those are worthwhile tools if anybody's interested in those. And specs, they're huge on specs. Um, so the style spec and the MB tile spec. Um, and just a, a shout out for QGIS. I use a lot for visualization of shape files. That's another cool tool. Um, Cloak and Tech I mentioned before. There's a tool here that's worth talking about is this tile server GL. If you have vector tiles, I would highly recommend you making use of their, their tile server for local testing of whatever vector tiles are. And then they have a tool called Map Tiler that's also you can use, it's a free tool you can use for viewing. Um, I mentioned Docker, it's, uh, I, just take a look at it, I have a couple Docker containers for um, GDAL, Tippecanoe, and other geotype tools that I, I maintain for my own use and for my clients or whatever. Okay, now I want to talk about Google. They're an incredibly important part of the story because of the, um, what I call encoding standards. Okay, so I, I haven't gotten to it yet, but I have rasters and I don't encode them in PNG or JPEG. They're too big, that's too big, and I have some data to show you with that. So I use something called WebP. Um, and this thing that call, is called Protobuf that uh, Google has open source, Mapbox has used it for something called GeoBuff, so there's a couple links in there. I'll go into more detail on the WebP because I can understand that a lot better. The Protobuf, it's like, it's under the hood and I haven't figured it out yet and haven't had a need to. So I'll go into this pipeline section now, chapter four, okay? So on the vector tiles, so it's a quick introduction to what vector tiles if you've never heard of it, but this is the pipeline is the most important part I want to show. So um, in a pipeline, you just you start with some blob of data and you want to get it into some other format. So on the left up here, I have elevation contour data and feet. I want to convert it from a shape file all the way down to an MB tile so I can pack that MB tile into the mobile app. That's, the, that's what this, uh, these lines and these boxes are, are meant to, to describe. Um, so to go from a shape file to MB tile, you use these tools OGR to OGR. Gets you to this intermediary, it gets you to this format, GeoJSON, not in, even intermediary, but you have to get it there at first, and then you run something called Tippy Canoe. And like I said, I have details on OGR and Tippy Canoe. Um, happy to share that and discuss that. So that's uh, contour data and all the other stuff like OSM data, trails, boundary points, UTM points, they also go through the same process. Okay? So that's terrain and composite. And I, I break those out because those are the two MB tiles that I make. Terrain becomes really big. You can imagine the packing level of something like uh, El Capitan. It doesn't pack very well versus a, a meadow. And then the, the roads and trails are in a different file. So I, I keep those uh, separate. That way I never have to rerun the terrain if I want to change something on the road. So that's kind of data, data handling. Now, um, I mentioned PNGs. So this is the not PNG, but the web, web P. And I'll, I'll get to WebP in a second. But there's a, the de def this definition of what a raster is from Mapbox. And here's that pipeline. Okay, so, and uh, just above it, I have a, some open source notes and steps and processes on how to pr extract images from a Geo PDF, if you're ever interested in that. Um, for hill shading and ortho images, um, this is the pipeline. You can see the steps. It uses uh, heavy on the GDAL, all running on the command line. And the intermediate steps are things like geotiffs. And um, really what we want to do is, um, you remember that picture of the, the paper map I showed you? That was one seven and a half minute quadrangle. Well, when you go to the Pacific Crest Trail, I couldn't even say how many it is. It's probably 30, probably more. So you're going to pack 30 paper maps? No, but that's a pretty easy answer. But when you try to cut that same area using 30 different paper mats or seven and a half minute quadrangles, you gotta think about stitching them together. So this step down here is this uh, GDAL build VRT uh, virtual format. What you wanna do is you, if you wanna tile virtually this seven and a half minute quadrangle and this one 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 and then start cutting it up for what you need for the ortho image data or the hill shading data, shaded relief. And then that last step is this WebP encoding. So I don't do PNG, like I said, but it's possible if you wanted to. And um, uh, all these process steps of, of, I've documented in open source. So let's talk about the compression. I keep saying WebP, it's awesome. Um, and data reduction, I'll, I'll, I, I, I'll mention that as well. So um, 
Why WebP? Well, it compresses better for what we're doing here. And we're mobile first. That's the point of this talk. So we don't care. All we need is a WebP render in the, in the iPhone, uh, something that can decomp decompress and view WebP. So I figured out how to do that using the open source Mapbox GL native. And, and instead of a PNG renderer, I have a WebP renderer. And it really makes a difference. I'll show you here on the data. So um, speed performance wise isn't, isn't a problem that I can tell. And, but the size of what I pack is a, is a major deal. Um, so the open source, how I, how I open sourced, what I did to open source, sorry, how I use WebP in my iPhone apps and, I, and when I get around to it for Android is uh, on this link here. It's um, instead of uh, Mapbox, it's my fork of the Mapbox GL native. And um, this, in the future, App, Apple isn't going to adopt WebP. That they made that clear at iOS 11. They have something else called Heif, H-E-I-F. And um, if, it made, it, if, if I had the funding or I wanted to go do the research, I'd go see what it would be like to go and code as Heif uh, to see if it's even smaller than WebP to, to, to squeeze out bits. OK, so here's a, Google's um, slide on like who supports WebP. And, pretty much Chrome and Opera. So I use it a lot. Uh, I have Chrome and Opera just for viewing WebP, but it, it just doesn't go anywhere else. And pretty much since Apple went with Heath, it's, it's not going to get the adoption. Even, even Firefox doesn't use it. But that's OK. I'm not in the browser world. I don't care. I'm in mobile first. I'm going to make WebP, and I can render it. Um, so I have a study. And it's going to be hard to get this on the, on the whole page, but um, just bear with me. So in, 28, in May, when I last gave this talk, I sampled this data. And what you need to look at is the app, the app size. And if it's bolded, it's uh, one of my apps, and it's using WebP. And then the last column is if I were to render it using PNG. So a lot of data in this, a couple di different dimensions besides two. So let's go through the, the not picking on anybody, and I'm giving, giving shout outs to the ones that to keep things small. So the Mapbox Studio Preview. So they just have, they've squeezed it down to fi about 15 megabytes. All their map data is in the cloud, they pull it down. Uh, great job. There's an open source project called Mage from the NGA. They did some, something similar, so really tiny. I am going to pick on the airlines and the banks because I, I, when I get down to here, I, I don't know why Bank of America has 150 megabytes. I don't know what their architecture is. I'm not picking on them, but it's just incredibly heavy. I don't even use it. So uh, I, look at, I, I look at size of data quite a, uh, of apps quite a bit. OK, so there's a cutoff I have in red at the bottom. Apple, um, last uh, developers conference or so, a year or so ago or whatever, they, lo they raised the ceiling of what you can download from a mobile app uh, from their app store. It used to be 100 megabytes, now it's 150. So that became a design center of like, OK, how do we stay under 150? Because if someone's going to Joshua Tree and they have really crappy service, why don't we make a great experience and have the smallest app possible to download so they can go in the park and enjoy it? Because when they get there, there is zero service there. Um, so if you see a red value, that means if I were to ship it with PNG, like this one, this Whitney one, I wouldn't even be able to meet that, that Apple um, cutoff. They'd have to go to Lone Pine, California, and find Wi-Fi to download it. And boy, somebody's, that map's not getting somebody's hands. So you can see the difference, about half, more than half. Yosemite, you can see the difference between red and um, red meaning PNG over here and um, uh, uh, with WebP. And this uh, San Bernardino National Forest, which has a ton of roads because it's right by um, eastern part, eastern county of Los Angeles, has a lot of roads in it. And um, it's a big area, so I wanted to get that compressed down pretty well. So I'm going to go into a couple demos that are online as well. So um, some I won't, these are all just videos, but I won't run them all, but I wanted to show like, I mentioned wilderness.net, wilderness and this is the actual colors that the Forest Service uses to determine where a wilderness boundary is. And the, the way the line goes is it's a black line with an orange interior. The interior is the wilderness area. And I found a really cool trick in Mapbox uh, styling, their styling spec, to be able to do that. I mentioned the National Park Service icons, and there it is, OK? The next demo is, this is the OSM part. So this, the, the, the trail, 
This trail, this connector trail to the California Hiking and Riding Trail, which is all in OSM, and then this boundary of the campground, and then these names and the Pinto Basin Road, that's all from OSM. Once again, I want to unlock what, what's out there. Um, if you had service, um, I want to unlock and allow other features. So, um, and this one, if you were to click on this information button for Bell Campground, you would get the weather for Bell. And um, you could check the weather and you could, you know, use, this is a, a map, also an Esri map that comes from weather.gov, but it's point location um, uh, weather uh, guessing. Sorry, I'm losing the word for whatever, weather forecast. There's Pendle Basin, there's the weather forecast. So again, let's get back into location, make a great experience, okay? And then for my last one, uh, I'm just going to let this, this little loop, but again, we're, this is what, what I want people to really enjoy. I don't want them enjoying their games or their social media apps. I want them to enjoy this. And um, this is, uh, like I said, this is Bell, Bell Mountain webcam from the MPS from last night. Once again, unlocking all, all stuff that we've had. So um, that's all I have. I've let this run, and this is just to give you an example. I'm available afterwards, and... Um, some of the apps are free in the Apple App Store, and I'd love to talk to you about it if you're ever interested in um, doing your own vector tiles for raster or vector, or if you have any questions, I'll take them now and afterwards as well. Thanks. Fantastic. So um, please uh, come up to me tonight or afterwards, whatever. Love to talk about backcountry and maps and offline maps or mobile, anything. So thanks very much for your time. Break time. <laughs>